Hello everyone and today we are going to discuss uh, passive microwave remote sensing and just recall uh, uh, when we have been discussing different types of remote sensing and uh, so two types basically we uh, differentiated one is active remote sensing and another one is passive remote sensing. In uh, active remote sensing as you know purely microwave remote sensing, but in passive under the category of passive remote sensing uh, there is also possibility of having passive microwave remote sensing because uh, objects na in natural objects also uh, without uh, having any uh, other source of energy they also emit energy in microwave part of EM spectrum though this energy is very very less compared to other uh, uh, like reflected or uh, or emitted energy and uh, this uh, passive uh, microwave energy is very less and uh, so natural objects when they emit and uh, that can also be recorded by sensors and uh, there were sensors uh, at a relatively very coarse resolution uh, which we will be discussing soon. So, what we see here that uh, this part of uh, EM spectrum uh, which is around uh, uh, 8 to 14 uh, micrometer that can be used here and uh, as you can also see this is the spectral radiance uh, excitance and uh, there we see that uh, passive microwave. So, this part is for active microwave or sorry for thermal microwave and this part is for the passive microwave 0.15 to 30 centimeter and uh, there uh, the black body radiation curve for this one is also shown uh, that uh, that is also shown here and uh, so we can we can see here that uh, this part of uh, microwave passive microwave signals can be recorded uh, by the satellites uh, though we know that uh, this energy is very small in amount and uh, uh, therefore, we re, uh, and it is in long wavelengths. So, the problem comes about the spatial resolution because in order to register uh, a signal into a sensor and that to around 850 kilometer away from the earth and uh, you require a large area uh, signals and therefore, uh, going or adopting for a uh, especially for very low resolution images, but uh, this has been done in past and uh, we will see that which are those uh, satellites and other things. So, microwave region um, in, in terms of frequency which we uh, discuss here that uh, uh, that is 1 to 200 gigahertz or in terms of uh, length 0 0.15 to 30 centimeter. And this uh, uses the same principles as thermal remote sensing because as in case of uh, thermal remote sensing objects above absolute zero emit energy which can be uh, recorded by, uh, by the sensors which works in the EM uh, thermal part of thermal infrared part of electromagnetic spectrum. So, similarly uh, a microwave uh, also is uh, emitted by some uh, by the objects, but it is a very low uh, energy and nonetheless that too can be recorded it does not matter how uh, low spatial resolution is. So, there, there has been uh, uh, sensors which are multi frequency sensors and multi polarizing polarization remote sensing in microwave passive microwave region has been done and uh, weak energy source so, we need a large IFOB and this, this is IFOB stands for instantaneous field of view and uh, bands also generally are very wide. So, because uh, the energy which is being emitted in microwave region by the natural objects is very, very, very small and therefore, as mentioned that in order to register by a sensor in a space, you require a a large IFOB instantaneous field of view and that basically uh, directly related with the spatial resolution and these band also not like uh, very uh, narrow bands you get uh, in 
middle part of EM spectrum. But here the bands are very very uh, large in that. So uh, more uh, closely to classical optical and thermal infrared sensors than radar. Why? Because uh, radar uh, is active microwave uh, whereas uh, uh, typical visible infrared thermal infrared are passive microwave remote sensing. So that is why it is specifically it is called passive microwave not a simple microwave radar remote sensing or active uh, remote sensing. Now microwave remote sensing uses wavelengths uh, about 1 centimeter to a few tens of centimeter enables observations in all weather conditions without basically restricting by the cloud or rain because the size of particles are smaller compared to wavelengths and therefore they do not put any uh, hindrance to these waves and they can pass through uh, clouds, rain or fog and uh, uh, such an advantage is not possible uh, as you know with visible or infrared because wavelength is very small and therefore uh, these uh, particles or water droplets they create problem in uh, visible or infrared thermal infrared remote sensing. Uh, in, in addition the microwave remote sensing also provides unique information and uh, that is uh, sea wind and wave directions uh, which are derived from frequency characteristics. Also we use Doppler effect and uh, different polarizations are also possible uh, in combination with the microwave remote sensing and of course back is scattering etc. So that cannot be observed by visible or infra, infrared sensors. So uh, for very special purposes microwave remote sensing is definitely employed and very useful. Uh, however, it needs for sophisticated data analysis. The data processing is completely different than data processing of your visible infrared or thermal infrared images or sensors. Where there you get directly images but in case of microwave remote sensing you get the data in waveforms and then analysis has to be uh, processing has to be done so that uh, we get a good uh, uh, in form of sort of images uh, so that it requires an intense processing. As I have already mentioned earlier also and today that uh, microwave remote sensing or overall remote sensing can be divided in two categories active and passive. Especially microwave remote sensing can also be divided in two categories. One is active uh, microwave which we will be discussing in detail later and then passive microwave which we are uh, discussing now. So the active type receives the backscattering because the satellite or sensor itself the sends the energy or signals pulse towards the ground and whatever is reflected back uh, by or after the delineation uh, it is uh, received by the same sensor. So uh, this, uh, this is basically the transmitted microwave uh, which is incident on the ground surface. And uh, best example of uh, this uh, is synthetic aperture radar. Um, there are micro microwave scattermeter, radar altimeters etc. They are all part of active microwave remote sensing. There are various uh, satellites we have uh, been discussing few more examples uh, and applications part we will be discussing later about active microwave remote sensing. In case of uh, passive uh, remote sensing which uh, receives the radi microwave radiation uh, emitted by the objects on the ground itself. So like in active the signal or pulse has to be sent by the sensor itself but here the natural emission uh, microwave emission is recorded that is why it is called passive. So microwave radiometer is one of the passive microwave sensors in uh, this category. In uh, passive microwave remote sensing uh, the, uh, the characteristics of an object can be detected from relationship between the received power and the physical characteristics of the object uh, such as attenuation or radiation characteristics. So by this uh, relation that is exploited uh, uh, like here 
and this is passive microwave sensors. So, uh, the main sensor here is the microwave radiometer and what are the targets uh, or where it can be applied. So, near, uh, near sea surface winds there it is being used, sea surface temperature or SST estimations it can be used, it is being used and uh, the condition of sea whether it is calm or uh, very volatile that can be seen, salinity also or sea ice, water vapor, cloud water contents, precipitation intensity all these things are being studied using passive microwave remote sensing. Air temperature also, wind, ozone, aerosol and NO2 and other atmospheric components are also there. Uh, I will be showing example where passive microwave remote sensing data has been used to even estimate snow depth in part of Himalaya. So, various applications are there and uh, this uh, we have already touched earlier and uh, that overall remote sensing can be divided in passive and active and uh, when we come for the passive this is how the passive microwave stands here uh, in case of active microwave and uh, that is ultimate, altimetry, scatterometry, synthetic aperture radar which is the most common component of active microwave. In case of passive microwave, pi, uh, passive microwave radiometry and microwave sounding these two things are being uh, used in case of passive remote sensing, passive microwave remote sensing. Now, uh, you know what exactly happens in case of uh, passive microwave remote sensing that uh, sensor detects uh, natural microwave energy. Uh, the emphasis here is the natural microwave energy, no artificial or synthetic energy is sent by the sensor itself, but it is the natural emission uh, in the microwave part of EM spectrum uh, which is being emitted by different objects or surface of the earth. So, these sensors on board of satellites are capable of detecting natural microwave energy which may which is may be reflected or emitted from the earth surface. Reflected sometimes in natural uh, nature in natural environment or in atmosphere also there might be some microwave energy and that is uh, uh, you know in, that interacts with the uh, earth surface and then again reflected. So, both kind of uh, um, uh, natural microwave energy can be recorded by these sensors. And uh, as you know that all objects in the natural environment emit not only the uh, in the uh, thermal part of uh, thermal infrared part of EM spectrum, but also in the microwave region. And sometimes they also reflect energy depending uh, the conditions and a very small amount of passive microwave energy. Uh, this, uh, the, this part I would like to emphasize that very small the amount of my energy which is uh, emitted or reflected uh, in a microwave region by natural objects is a very tiny amount and therefore, you, you require a large IFOB and consequently you end up with a very coarse resolution images or data. So, magnitude of uh, this um, passive microwave emission is uh, basically proportional to the product of emissivity of the target and its surface temperature. So, recall these uh, Wayne's displacement law and uh, other uh, laws which we have discussed uh, that uh, it will depend basically or it is proportional to the product of the emissivity of the target and its temperature. So, if temperature is more the emissivity of the target is going to be more you will have more passive microwave energy and therefore, it can be recorded. And so, here though as, uh, uh, as discussed that uh, though the energy might be a very small one in microwave region, but uh, whatever how weak it is, but anyway uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is in the long wavelength and it can be recorded by the sensors. As uh, these curves we have uh, already discussed, so very briefly I will go that on the y axis you are having a uh, spectral radiant emittance in uh, watts per square in, um, in different wavelengths 
and, and the wavelength is here and this is what you see that uh, there is a and this visible part is shown here. So, see this uh, uh, 300 uh, Kelvin curve and uh, other other this that is uh, for natural objects or earth surface. So, this is spectral radiance uh, which is again uh, on another uh, axis is there. And so, as you, as you see that when we go for the uh, lower wavelength, uh, we get a high emittance, but uh, when we go towards the longer wavelength and uh, especially uh, I am talking about uh, uh, passive microwave region, then the energy which is getting emitted it becomes very small. All these curves though they are very much separated in the visible part of EMS spectrum and they become almost same at the end here in 100 microwave, micrometer range. So, the energy is very very low, the weak uh, long wave radiation is there. The visible energy I have already mentioned and black body radiation curve is 577 uh, Kelvin or at the sun's uh, sun's temperature that is sun temperature is shown in yellow and uh, then black body radiation is earth's temperature. This is the 300 Kelvin is the earth one. So, you can see that even uh, your solar energy or uh, sun's temperature that too uh, uh, is becomes a very small when we go towards the long wavelength. This is 100 micrometer thing. So, there is a radiation. Uh, from thermal bodies even at uh, longer wavelengths and extending into microwave region of the EM spectrum and that part of microwave region uh, is uh, exploited and that uh, whole thing we call as a passive microwave. So, passive microwave sensors uh, use an antenna also called as horn to detect photons at microwave frequencies you know longer wavelengths which are then converted into voltage in a circuit and so this is inside a microwave radiometer and these scanning microwave radiometers there can be of uh, different types one is the mechanical rotation or mirror focuses a microwave energy on two horns like uh, this is that uh, horn is shown here. So, the main uh, lobby of observation area and side lobby of the observation area. And so, this is the from the side uh, the, uh, the horn is detecting, this is from the directly it is detecting and uh, uh, basically the TB, the TB component is the uh, uh, in terrain emission a natural one and then there might be some reflected also and uh, some other uh, type of energy in microwave region might be av available like atmospheric and downward emission. So, TDN is also there atmospheric downward emission which later on uh, may be scattered and that becomes scattered radiation and uh, of course, then at atmospheric upward emission is also there that is uh, uh, T up is the atmospheric one. So, this whole area is providing energy not only the terrain emission energy but energy which is being generated uh, within the atmosphere uh, in passive microwave part of EM spectrum. So, that all is recorded by this horn or antenna. And there might be some energy which might be coming through this uh, side lobe which is observation. So, again atmospheric component is there and natural emission or terrain emission component is all there. So, this uh, this is how and the passive microwave and sensors work. Now, what are the uh, uh, current and future polar orbiting microwave sensors are there and uh, there, there is series of satellites DMSP which carried lot of sensors and uh, JAXA is a Japanese uh, agency uh, space agency and of course, uh, ESA is also there. So, SSMIs uh, were very popular and uh, they were launched earlier also continuing with that and uh, then you are having AMSR uh, 5 year life. So, various uh, 
um, microwave radiometers are there like advanced microwave scanning radiometer 3, European meteorological operational satellite METOP is also providing data and others. And uh, earlier also um, the past sensors were also many were there. So, this uh, in passive micro region there are at least uh, uh, few satellites which are providing data. Uh, spatial resolution part uh, we have already discussed, but uh, very briefly I will touch again here that uh, uh, on x axis we are having spatial resolution and here we are having a temporal resolution. So, this is spatial resolution versus temporal resolution that uh, uh, these uh, active uh, SAR uh, the temporal resolution generally uh, like uh, ER, ER, ESR or uh, Sentinel or NVSET generally the, the repeat cycle is about uh, 35 days. So, if today uh, it has passed over an area then the satellite will be again coming or revisiting after almost 35 days. Uh, but they were for some time uh, ERS uh, had uh, two satellites in tandem and this time was and this time was reduced by half roughly. And uh, when we go for the passive microwave because the spatial resolution is very coarse, very poor and therefore, uh, the repeat repeatability becomes one day or two days. So, there is a uh, sort of inverse relation uh, between spatial resolution and temporal resolution. Higher the spatial resolution and uh, poor the temporal resolution and vice versa is also that higher the uh, temporal resolution and uh, generally you are having a uh, coarser spatial resolution as depicted here that uh, passive microwave can have data we can have data almost every day, but in case of active microwave the temporal resolution is about of 35 days. So, these are the uh, limitations uh, of uh, uh, active microwave and same time limitations of passive microwave in terms of spatial resolution and this runs in kilometers. So, that, that point we will be also coming here. Uh, passive microwave can penetrate clouds and provide information during night time as also in case of active microwave because of longer wavelength and daily passive microwave data available on global basis because of coarser spatial resolution. Now, earlier there were many uh, sensors were there or radiometers on various satellites. So, there were one satellite Nimbus which had a sensor SMMMR and uh, that lasted between 1978 to 87. So, about 9 years it worked frequencies bear between these ranges and uh, uh, now the spatial resolution of footprint of was of this size. So, quite coarse resolution data. Then on this DMSP satellite again uh, we had this SSMI sensor or radiometer that and uh, so once this SMMR was over and uh, this uh, started working and it uh, of course, the spatial resolution here is improved and relatively and uh, there were also changes in the frequency uh, in the they are generally when uh, we discuss about passive microwave uh, or active microwave uh, we instead of uh, in terms of wavelength and uh, we use the frequency and uh, terminology for microwave part of EM spectrum. And uh, then aqua satellite also there are uh, uh, Terra and aqua. Uh, so, both are having modis sensors as well, but here we are not discussing modis sensor AMSR sensor and uh, as you know that Terra Aqua became operational in 2002. So, since then there were series. So, uh, like MODIS sensor is continuing. So, this uh, MSR are also continuing and the frequencies are mixed compared to SSMR and SSMI and of course, again uh, see the resolution improvement in resolution is continuous. So, this is now uh, coming in a relatively higher spatial resolution as compared to between 1978 
and 87. Uh, which uh, uh, some applications of passive microwave remote sensing we have already touched, but now very specifically we will go for, for land, for land uh, applications of passive microwave we can use for soil moisture studies, a snow water equivalent and uh, this is what uh, we ourselves also use some time back, land surface temperature and anomalies these can be used and have also been used. Then o, uh, this OSINs in case of water you can have ice extent, concentration and other types of ice, sea surface temperature like land surface temperature can also be used. Basically temperature estimations are possible with passive microwave remote sensing. Then atmospheric water and uh, surface wind speed of the sea surface and uh, uh, cloud liquid water rainfall rate of precipitation intensity and there also it can be used. Uh, they, they, these are the examples of uh, SSMR, SMMR data and uh, this is what uh, we did 9 years average snow depth estimation of part of Himalaya uh, which we have uh, done between 1979 to 87 which was uh, this SMMR as uh, uh, discussed earlier that it was on the Nimbus 7 satellites and uh, which lasted about uh, 4 5 years in a space and provided uh, the data though the resolution here was about uh, 30 kilometer spatial resolution I am talking about. But uh, uh, there are no other ways to estimate a snow depth than passive microwave remote sensing, no other technique of remote sensing can work to estimate a snow depth uh, even in part like rugged terrain like Himalaya. So that, that is the only resort or only option available uh, that we imply adopt uh, passive microwave for such a special kind of work. Of course now as uh, mentioned earlier uh, that uh, now spatial resolution has improved so our estimations of snow depth can also be improved in future and uh, once uh, these data sets are employed uh, there and the biggest advantage is uh, that they are available on regular basis. Also I have discussed that uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, the, the passive microwave uh, can be used for uh, these land surface temperature and anomaly. So let us see that example also. And uh, that uh, we have also uh, used that data SSMI derived weekly surface temperature anomaly maps which were available to us between 1988 to 2000. So these are the weekly average uh, basically these are anomaly maps compared with the uh, base period between 1988 to uh, 2002 and if you dig out a week data compared to average you get uh, that thing. So if you put in a time series like in this example related with an earthquake, pre-earthquake thermal anomaly and it was observed that uh, uh, in this case the earthquake occurred on 4th March 99, 90, 1990 and uh, uh, that, is, that is falling in, in the third image uh, uh, this earthquake epicenter is shown here. So, uh, uh, one week before this uh, earthquake has occurred as you can see that lot of anomaly thermal anomaly has been observed. Though the resolution here temporal resolution is weekly data, but uh, if uh, every day basis the data can be analyzed in time series estimating first the surface temperature then exactly one can know that uh, when this uh, anomaly was maximum and then what happened after that and then and just before the earthquake and after the earthquake. Though this study was done based on the available uh, weekly data but if daily data is available uh, against a base period of uh, between 88 to 2002 or even to current then things can improve. So this was a Kalat earthquake of uh, Pakistan of magnitude 6.1 a identifiable and recognizable uh, pre-earthquake thermal anomaly was seen in 
weekly surface temperature anomaly maps which were prepared using SSMI data which is passive microwave data. So, it is possible though the resolution may be uh, relatively coarse, but it is because the, that provides the advantage that on daily basis you can have data and it can cover a very large area. So, if, if a application like this one uh, in order to study the pre-earthquake thermal anomalies, we need to cover a large area and uh, therefore, for such kind of studies passive microwave remote sensing can be a very apt uh, uh, data set available to us. And uh, there are various uh, earthquakes uh, which we have studied using this uh, another set of data from DMSP satellite and the sensor or radiometer was SSMI. This was uh, and uh, you know the thermal anomaly which was detected in Kalat about 2 weeks before in case of Jiangvi it was 3 weeks before 1 week because the data was weekly average data. So, uh, we cannot go basically within a week and uh, uh, just some guess can be done that whether few days before the week or so on. And what was the intensity of uh, rise in temperature was 2 to 10 degree which is very significant 6 to 10 degree 4 to 8 degree and so on. So, uh, 7 examples are here where passive microwave remote sensing data has been employed. So, this brings to the end of uh, this discussion about uh, passive microwave remote sensing. Uh, there are obviously advantages uh, with the passive microwave uh, that it covers a very large area on daily basis data is available though at coarse resolution. And uh, there are many applications uh, where this data can be employed and uh, some applications where otherwise it is not possible to achieve those results, but employing passive microwave data like in snow depth studies or uh, these uh, land surface temperature anomaly studies, a uh, lot of applications, a lot of areas can be benefited. So, this brings to end of this discussion. Thank you very much.